Morning, Solid Rock. If you haven't been to River Ridge Mall, I suggest you go. They have live music in the middle uh, where they made the new staircase. And yesterday I got to hear Hart the Herald Angel sing on trombones with three different key changes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I was the youngest person standing there and I had a wonderful time. People are still proclaiming Christ's name, even if it's not in words. Um, it's the time of year where people don't realize what they're listening to until they listen to it. Um, so if you go out and support these things, they'll keep doing it. If you really want that Christmas, if you really want Christ shown, you got to go and support these. There's churches doing concerts and they're bringing in orchestras. So, um, you know, Look what's going on in your community and really go out and, and support it. Some of it's free and it's, it's there for you. Um, you know, bring your friends, bring your family to go out and support that and, and enjoy this time of year for what it's about and what people have to offer. It was just really nice. It was really, really nice. I, I'd like to say something here because you're talking about the horns, the trombones and yeah. stuff like that. 
<laughs> well, so Nebuchadnezzar, whenever he had a procession, oh yeah, he would have. I was going to get Dave to recite oh, it because he's read it so many the, times. The dulcimer, the harp, the sackbut, the flute, and it was about a dozen other instruments. Stall, stall, yeah, yeah, stall. Yeah. So every time he came in a procession, he would have this whatever this tune was because it wasn't just a blast. His you know, band. you don't have all those go. instruments. And he, okay, here we go. Okay, he said. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. If a king on this earth had all that played every time he came, what do you think the king of kings is going to have played? Mm -hmm. We're going to hear Amen. some music. Amen. 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 <laughs> what a French horn. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> all right. If you know these songs, please sing them along with us this morning, church. In a cave, a lowly stable, Christ our Lord was born. From the heavens, wide world angels sang that holy morn. No that song from an old hymn book yes. yeah never heard it songs. anywhere else mm -hmm. have you heard it since then no. never no. heard it anywhere else but that that song just blessed us so we had to share it in a cave mm -hmm. now you know this next one we do it a little little bit different not just too much different yep, yep. um so feel free to sing along the song is called silent night silent night holy night
flowered mid the snows. I love those songs with those long mm -hmm. titles, especially if they have nothing to do with the song, but this one does. Um, but I hope that this is a blessing to your heart. Amen. Do you, you know, some folks here don't know that we're one of them. So That's true. When we hey, get everyone. together, yeah. us four ladies, we have a name. It's not just them girls, them women. Them girls. Uh, we are one accord when we sing together. And we don't get to do it as often as we used to. Um, but it's always great. I had them in my home Thursday night. Yeah, we were rehearsing, right. and it's always wonderful it fellowship and, and rehearsal time. And I'm, I'm super grateful this time of year we get to get together and bless the yeah. church with some music. If you've been yeah. coming here throughout the years, you kind of know what to expect around Christmas time. And I think that's, it's, a, it's like a tradition, and it it's, a, it's really time. enjoyable. Yes, it is. When blossoms flowered amid the snows Upon a winter night Was born the child, the Christmas rose The King of love and light The angels sang a shepherd's song The grateful Said birth the stars in exultation voice. Oh, come, let us adore Oh, come, let us adore Appreciate those listening by radio as well and TV. God bless you. And just want to say Merry Christmas to each and every one. God bless you. At this time, I ask our uh, 
Deacons, come forward for our morning tithes and offerings, if you would, please. I always pick up the wrong microphone. Here, one of y'all take this and go from there. I'm glad I got the mic today because we're going to say this to that little square box out there. We here at Solid Rock desire to fear the name of the Lord. And I hope you will too. Very important. Very important. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom and also knowledge. That's what God's Word tells us. Amen. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would worship you this day in your fear, holding you above everything. Lord Jesus, in your sacred throne, Lord Jesus. In your very presence, we thank you for. Holy Christ, use us, teach us today. Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus Christ, move upon this assembly. May we become richer in a relationship with you, Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Please bring your tithes and offerings to the front. Come, now is the time to worship. Come. Special treatment here. Now is the time to give. you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. May we all rise for dedication of our tithes and offerings. Father God, we thank you for this day, Father. We thank thee that you've led our hearts and minds here to this church to hear your word. May we all be receptive to it and understand the reason of the season is all because of you. Thank you, Lord God, for this day. May everything we do here today be for your glory and honor. In Christ's name we ask all of this. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our children are dismissed to their classroom. Amen. <coughs> That's Brother Josh Janell. Wherever he's at, I didn't see him a minute ago. There he is. Come on down. Give us our scripture this morning. Oh, yeah. I got it. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, folks. Today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you'd like to stand for that. I'm going to start with a prayer. Holy Father, thank you for all letting us be here. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. I want you to guide our hearts and minds today as we go through this season. I want you to prepare each and every one of us for the work that you have set out for our lives. I thank you for letting us come to you to even ask for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So Apollos and I should be looked upon as Christ's servants who distribute God's blessings by explaining God's secrets. Now the most important thing about a servant is that he does just what the master tells him to do. What about me? Have I been a good servant? Well, I don't worry over what you think about this or what anyone else thinks. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but even that isn't final proof. It is the Lord himself who must examine me and decide. So be careful not to jump to conclusions before the Lord's return as to whether someone is a good servant or not. When the Lord comes, he will turn on the light so that everyone can see exactly what each one of us is really like deep down in our hearts. Then everyone will know why we have been doing the Lord's work. At that time, God will give 
to each one whatever praise is coming to him. I have used Apollos and myself as examples to illustrate what I have been saying, that you must not have favorites. You must not be proud of one of God's teachers more than, one, more than another. What are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you are so great? And as though God has accomplished something on your own. Mm. Let me say that again. And if, let me take a breath. Praise the Lord. What are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all that you have is from God, why act as though you are so great and as though you have accomplished something on your own? You seem to think you already have all the spiritual food you need. You're a full and spiritually contended, contended rich. Hmm. You seem to think you have all the spiritual food you need. You are full and spiritually contended rich kings on your thrones, leaving us far behind. I wish you really were already on your thrones. For when that time comes, you can be sure that we, we, be, we will be there too, reigning with you. Sometimes I think God has put us apostles at the very end of the line, like prisoners soon to be killed, put on display at the end of a victor's parade to be stared at by men and angels alike. Religion has made us foolish, you say, but of course, you're all such wise and sensible Christians. We are weak, but not you. We are well off. <clears throat> you are well off while we are laughed at. To this very hour, we have gone hungry and thirsty without even enough clothes to keep us warm. We have been kicked around without homes of our own. We have worked wearily with our hands to earn our living. We have blessed those who cursed us. We have been patient with those who injured us. We have replied quietly when evil things have been said about us. Yet right up to the present moment, we are like dirt underfoot, like garbage. I'm not writing about these things to make you ashamed, but to warn and counsel you as beloved children. For although you may have 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, remember that you only have one me as your father. For I was the one who brought you to Christ when I preached the gospel to you. So I beg you to follow my example and do as I do. This is the very reason why I'm sending Timothy to help you do this, for he is the one of those I won to Christ, a beloved and trustworthy child in the Lord. He will remind you of what I teach in all the churches wherever I go. I know that some of you have, been, have become proud thinking that I'm afraid to come and deal with you. But I will come, and soon, if the Lord will let me, and then I will find out whether these proud men are just big talkers or whether they really have God's power. The kingdom of God is not just talking. It is living by God's power. Which do you choose? Shall I come with punishment and scolding, or shall I come quiet? with quiet love and gentleness. Amen. Without a song, that threatens to tear a rip in the space-time continuum there, don't you think? <laughs> At least we're back to wearing black today. Yes. If you want to talk, she does. 
Well, does anybody have um, a testimony or a word from the Lord or a brag on Jesus? If you got one this morning before I get started, come on up here and share it. Now, there we go. We got one coming. And uh, we'll take a couple or three of them. A couple of weeks ago, I got the opportunity to share my many testimony, and I realized there was a, a couple of things very briefly that I forgot. When I was in the hospital for six months, they came and told me I had a uh, potentially fatal level of potassium, and I needed to go on dialysis. So. Okay, go ahead and do. So they gave me the needles and all that. And when I left, they told me, you have a potentially fatal level of something called creatinine in your blood. Now creatinine is a waste product that's developed by the muscles. And an excess of it can kill you. So I got home and they referred me to a facility in Amherst and there's wonderful, wonderful women that are working there. And I got there the first day and this woman, her name is Terry, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, I love her to death. But what she said to me was, this is your life now. And I said, I'm going to walk out of here one day and not ever going to have to come back. Okay? I will be normal. And for me, that's your definition of Christ's wife. So anyway, so she said, okay. She said, on that day, I will escort you out. And we'll make a big deal out of it. So I said, okay. We made that agreement. And I kept on telling them, I said, look, I will be normal. I, this is not my life's solution for me. So they kept on, the doctor kept on coming to see me, the nephrologist, the kidney doctor, and he kept on saying, and he kept on talking about my creatinine levels, and he says, your results are looking pretty good. And they kept on telling me this. So I told Morgan, the nurse, and Angie, the technician, and Emily, the other technician that were caring for me, I said, well, I said, look, if my creatinine level is so good, I, I want to start coming twice a week. So we kicked it around, and they made me take some tests. And then Morgan comes to me one day and says, you know, and I'm holding my breath, she said, you know, if your results are as good as they were the last time, I see no reason why you have to come back. So I said, okay. And then that afternoon, they came and told me, that later that morning, they came and told me, 22 months after I had started, that I was free to go. And I... And I told them, and I keep on telling the nephrologist, and he just kind of looks at me, and the doctor just kind of looks at me, my doctor. And I said, look, I'm, not, I'm never going back because God knows when he wants me coming home. And it's not, I said, I refuse to live a lifestyle that dialysis does to the vast majority of people that are there. God rescued me out of dialysis. But one of the things he gave me was an attitude that I will not submit to this. And I'm not going to. And also, I called him the other day. I didn't know this. They had suggested to me, well, you really ought to consider a kidney transplant. And I said, no. I looked at what a kidney transplant entails and what it involves. And I told him, no, I'm not getting one. And so I called him the other day and told him, 
And uh, he said, well, it's interesting you should call because we had a meeting the other day and we took you off the list anyway. So praise the Lord for that. What's that? Yeah, that's right. A year this month that I have been released from dialysis. So I will never go back to doing that. Jesus will, Jesus will cover me in the interim. Jim was talking about, Jim was using me as an example uh, this morning. I only heard the tail end of it. But um, never, ever, ever doubt what the creator God of the universe can do in you. Never, ever doubt. Just trust. Praise the Lord. Um, I always will take opportunity to, to praise God whenever I have a chance. Today is a special day, though. Not everyone knows who Norm is. Norm, would you stand up, please? Norm is our, as an IT specialist, but he's been uh, working with our youth over on uh, on Colony Road um, on Wednesday night. <coughs> and he is about to go to work at Christ's Hands in Kentucky. We're so excited that he's got an opportunity to do, do their IT work there. He's going to be living on, on premises for a while. And um, he's going to be leaving Friday, is that right? Thursday. He's leaving Thursday, and uh, he'll be coming back back and forth periodically, but um, he's going to be doing a whole lot of stuff there. No telling what God's going to put on him, because you know that's the way that God does. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you think you got it figured out what God wants you to do until you start doing it, and then what? Oh yeah, that too. Okay. So. We covet your prayers for Norm because God's got his hand on him and we just, we just need to pray God's blessings and support and strength for him. He will also need money. Did we ever get a GoFundMe set up? We're, we're trying to get a GoFundMe. That would be through Facebook? Yes. Uh, set up for him. Because uh, it's, it is a ministry, so he's not going to be getting a you know a big bundle of money and all that. Um, so uh, look for that through our website, uh, through our Facebook page. I mean, and um, and see what you can do to help. Every, every everybody helps a little bit, it'll help him a lot. And God always abundantly blesses what you give, so it will be enough for what our brother needs. Thank you. Do we have one one more? We got time for one more. Come on, brother. And Candy promised me she was gonna give me that song so I'd be able to preach afterwards, okay? Who loves sports? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well you. Ah, yeah. Amen. So we've seen how many people? gather in the stadiums, fields, raising their hands, raising their hands, the wind, go, win. Why can't that many people go in the stadium for God? Amen. Yeah. Hi. Right. That's right. Yeah. Think what it'd be like. Woo, there's a father. All right. There's a son. There's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is, that, is that wrong? No, that's true. I mean, we could pile in and spend money on tickets. I took some boys, coach basketball last year at the NBA games. And to sit from here to the house across the street, $3,500 a ticket, and people go. 
Our tickets was 80 apiece, and we sat in the nosebleeds. So one day, all these people that do that and don't think about giving for God, they're going to have to answer. That's true. And that includes me and in my times of trial. But I've wanted to say that for years because I've always thought about it, you know. Anybody knows what the wave is? You start in one end of the stadium. We go, woo, and then woo. Yep. Imagine, imagine, Nikki, that many people in, in a field doing that for God. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So I've been wanting to say that for years, try to keep my composure, but it touches me. Every time I go to a game or, you know, watch Michigan, Penn State, Ohio, or UVA, and, and that's just, I mean, all the sports, it, it's just crazy, but one day, everybody's going to be doing the wave. Amen. Amen. I am not a sports fan, and I completely agree with what he had to say. I can have fun at a game. That's as far as it goes. But I think there's something to be said that we're all, we can all get excited about anything. Yeah. And we as Christians have a lot to be thankful for, yeah. grateful for, excited about. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of help with the perfect segue into this song, man. You didn't even know you were doing that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'm trying to scratch the ceiling with this one. If you would, please stand to your feet. It's not a Christmas song, it's technically an Easter song, but they fit together, duh. The song is called Hosanna in the Highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Highest, Hosanna. to break out that wave, y'all. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, our God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's sing that chorus one more time. <clears throat> Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord our God. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Thank you, church. That is true. Well, I want to start off with a question, and it's kind of a dumb question because you, you know we know the answer already. Have you ever felt like a misfit? Maybe you do now. I don't know. Have you ever felt abandoned before? Nobody cared enough to stick around and care for you? Do you ever feel unloved? I'm not trying to depress you, I'm just asking a question. Feel like no one loves you because maybe you didn't measure up. 
Well, that's not real love to start with. Ever felt like you were not as good as others? Ever felt like nothing ever worked out for you? Are you one who never quite fits in with other people's ideas? Believe it or not, that's a big problem in churches too. In other words, you're a misfit. A pastor once told me back years ago, Dave, you're a nut magnet. I told him we might all be nuts, but we're screwed on to a good bolt. <clears throat> well, Jesus was looked upon as a misfit. He was. Religious leaders didn't want him. Far from that. Religious people, I just note I said religious. Religious people didn't want him. Do you know who he fit in with? The rough crowd. You'd find him down at the tea room or the Waffle House before you'd find him at Fratelli's Trattoria. I'll probably get sued for saying that. We often look at appearances and we look at people's resources and wealth and such as means of whether they fit in or not, but God doesn't do that. In Luke chapter 16, <clears throat> Jesus was telling verse 19 through, well, let's see, 25. He was telling a, a, a true story. It wasn't a parable because he gave names and, a, and, and no moral at the end of the thing. He just told it was an actual story. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died also and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torment, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said this, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. Thou art tormented. And Jesus here was teaching the fact that while you may not fit in here, in this lifetime, and have anything here, you can one day if you follow Christ and trust him. Yes. You need to also understand those that are in ministry work. That working with misfits means you might get your hands dirty. Real ministry is tough. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40, there came a leper to Jesus, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If you will, you can make me clean. The first rule that was broken there was it was forbidden in those days for a leper to approach another person on the street. They usually had to go over to the other side with a cloth over their upper lip crying, unclean, unclean. So it was a big no-no for a leper to walk up to Jesus. But when you're a, let me tell you this, when you're a misfit in trouble, you don't have time to worry about protocol, do you? You want to get to Jesus right now. You want that help right now. And it doesn't matter whether it's proper to do this or proper to do that. I remember one time I tried to drive across a bridge after a horrible storm late one night and the water got up in my Toyota station wagon into the floorboards and was getting and I couldn't see it on the bridge until it was too late and it was picking my car up 
And all I could holler was, Jesus, you got to help me right now. I didn't have time to get and start thanking for this and <laughs> buttering him up, you know. I just yelled, Jesus, you got to help me right now. And miraculously, the car started after it failed, and the wheels spinning in the water got me back up on the dry pavement. No, you don't have time to worry about protocol. You run toward help. And you don't waste time with being proper. So this misfit comes running to Jesus. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, another big no-no, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And so here we find Jesus with compassion on the misfit leper. He knows his loneliness he knows his sickness. He knows his pain. And now Jesus is going to break all the rules. And he puts his hand on this man. And that could get you killed. He not only spoke to him, he touched him and he cleansed him. He made a misfit whole again. And he took a risk to do so. So when we preach against sin as ministers... We must always show that not only how bad that is, but there is a way out. Never give the bad news without giving the good news. Always do that and be compassionate. John chapter 8 and verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and he taught them. Now here's another test that's going to be given to Jesus by the religious leaders and the phonies. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and they set her right in the midst of all of them. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the, law, in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Trying to trip him up. And this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Many people wonder, what was he writing? Probably the names of their girlfriends, <laughs> if the truth be told. Whatever it was, it scared the dickens out of them. And they said, uh, they, and, and so when they kept asking him, he lifted up himself and he just said this to him: He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. And he stooped down and kept writing on the ground. I'd love to have seen that. Maybe it was John 3.16, I don't know. And when they heard it, they were convicted by their own conscience and went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Jesus was dealing with one of the biggest misfits of all. A person who was immoral and had committed literally under a Hebrew law a capital offense, which was adultery. And here Jesus stuck his neck out for that one too. That no one wanted to have anything to do with her except to stone her to death. And when her accusers surrounded her, she had nobody to care, no one to come to her defense. And so Jesus told her in love, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. And as a result, her life was changed. He saved this misfit's life. So now let's go to my favorite group of misfits, the Island of Misfit Toys. 
I know everybody in here, don't lie to me, you've all watched Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I watch it once every year. I do it to torment myself. <laughs> These toys on this island had ostensibly been rescued by King Moonracer. That was a lion, I believe it was. And they were brought to the island as all the toys had been created with visible differences, such as a doll named D a Dolly for Sue. That was her name. That's all the names she had that only weeps, and according to the writer of that little show, she had emotional problems from being abandoned. There are people in here today that are suffering from, from that, from being abandoned, so it's kind of real. Then there was a train with square wheels, a jack-in-the-box named Charlie, Charlie in the box. That just doesn't seem to fit, does it? An elephant with pink polka dots, a cowboy that rides an ostrich, and an owl that swims, and a squirt gun that only shot grape jelly, and an airplane that couldn't fly. So y'all kind of get this, don't you? Can you identify with any of them? That part of the show Maybe it's because I'm Irish, I don't know, but it really gets to me. When they think that they're going to get rescued and it didn't look like anybody was going to show up, so Charlie said, I'll just go to sleep and dream of next year. And then a dolly for Sue starts crying. And she says, I haven't any dreams left to dream. Every time when I watch that, the waterworks starts up for me. I'm sorry, but that's me. I watched it a few weeks ago, and I turned my head so Donna couldn't see that, but I'm sure she knew. That always bothers me. Every time I watch that. All my life, I have been a defender for the underdog. I've been that way since I was a child. Maybe that's God, what God wanted me to be what God wanted me to do. And, and I warn you, sometimes being a champion for the underdog, the dog will come back and bite you sometimes. It will. And I think of the 30 years that we've been here and the underdogs that we have gone to and poured our life into them and helped them, and some of them bit us on the hand. But I'm going to tell you this, if you're able to rescue one, it was worth it. It's worth it. Don't ever be afraid to do that. We all get burned sometimes, but it's all right. Go ahead. It's a much better thing to rescue somebody that will appreciate it and turn their life around rather than being afraid of getting bit again. Ever since we started the church, we've gone in search of those that nobody wants. Our very first church service was held in the American Legion Hall in January of 1993. And we were in there for about a month before we moved to another place at Timberlake. And it was our very first service. And uh, several families, we got together to start that church. And we would put, an, I think, an ad in the paper about our church. It was called Fellowship Community Church back then. And we still are in a lot of ways. And this one lady opened the door. I'd never seen her before in my life. And she peeped around the door and looked at us real good before she walked in. And none of us were dressed up, you know. And she wanted to meet the pastor. And she come up to me and talked to me for a few minutes. And I said, um, ma'am, why did you peep in the door when you first got here? Well, it, it said Fellowship Community Church is what she said, so I wasn't really sure what kind of people y'all were. And I said, oh, we're just a normal church like anybody else. We don't get the chickens out until after the offering. And I saw the color go out of my face, and she went, oh, my Lord. And I said, no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. And we became friends until she had moved away. 
and she was part of our church family, but my mouth will get me in trouble sometimes. I couldn't help it. But really, you know, when Jesus was telling the account of the great supper that was made and none of the elite would show up, he told them to go out in the highways and the hedges and get the crippled, the lame, the marred, and the scarred. And that's what we are here for. We're not everybody's cup of tea. I know that. Somebody came in here one day, a, a, a couple, to try the church out, and they were dressed like, as my parents used to say, that's like somebody that come out of a bandbox. And I walked by, and I had long hair then. And I may yet again, I don't know. I mean, you don't ever know what I'm going to do. And they looked at me so disgusted, but they endured that until they saw me come up here on the platform and all the color went out of their face. They were horrified that that long-haired thing was up there and he was the pastor. And they ducked out during the prayer fast as they could like the building was on fire. They would have never, they would have never fit in here, that's for sure, because they thought they were better than everybody else. And that's, well, anyway... A lot of us are put together wrong according to the world, to this world. Many of us are forgotten and put away. Any of you ever felt like that before? We've got three cats, black cats at home. They were all abandoned and we took them in and they really, really loved Donna because they took one look at me and they knew she was kind to strays. That's what I think they do. So, now let's look at how a great king, greatest king had ever lived after God's own heart cared for the misfit. The wonderful King David is heading now to the house of misfit toys. I'm going to give you the scripture in 2 Samuel 9. And he's, now that everything is over and he is king and he, and, all, and even the families that were against him, he was showing pa uh, compassion to. Now he's going to look for whom he can show love to, even the family of his former enemy, Saul. And in 2 Kings chapter 9, we find that both King Saul and his son Jonathan were all dead. And there were very few people left in the family. They were all killed in battle. And all that was left was a bunch of misfits that no one even thought were fit to kill. Isn't that terrible that you're such a misfit nobody even thinks you're fit to kill? Well, it was true. Maybe you felt like you weren't worth killing before. Well, in verse 9, verse 1, well, no, verse 1, David said, Is there any yet that is left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And Jonathan was David's best friend, who was the son of Saul, his enemy, and now even Jonathan is dead. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Are you Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet. That term lame on his feet, wow. He wasn't even thought of as a viable human being. He didn't even give him his name. Oh, he's got a kid that's lame in his feet. They didn't take care of handicapped people very well back then. They were pretty much abandoned. But yet David is seeking one of those misfits. Remember, he was a man after God's own heart. And he was showing how God felt about these things. And so the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. Then the king sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And so David sent and had this misfit brought to him. And his name was Mephibosheth. 
And so now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, he called him by his name. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Poor old crippled Mephibosheth. He was horrified. He was sure that David was going to kill him. Because that's what kings did when they rose to power. They wiped out all of their enemy. But David was going to show them the way that God did it. And he felt like he wasn't worthy of anything else. And David said unto him two greatest words, Fear not, fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore you all the land of Saul, your father, and you will eat bread at my table continually. Wow. That's what Jesus is saying to us this morning. He wants to show mercy where it was never deserved. Compassion where it was never deserved. And he, he said, I want you to sit at the king's table. That was like the highest honor that you could get. He said, I want you in fellowship with the king. I want you to eat the king's food. And I want you to dwell in my presence. And that is what the Lord is saying to us this morning. That's why Jesus came to start with. To save sinners. And to bring them into fellowship. And Mephibosheth, all he could do is he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou should look upon a dead dog as I am? That's all he thought of himself as. He had been depressed and degraded and downtrodden, abandoned and forgotten to the point to where he referred to himself as a dead dog. Mephibosheth knew he was worthy of nothing. Even told the king, what do you want to do with a dead dog like me? Oh, the mercy of God. Think about it. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and all of his house. He's a landowner now. He's a wealthy man all of a sudden now. He's got everything back now. And not only did he show mercy, but he showed grace too. And gave him the inheritance of all that pertained to King Saul. David could have taken it for himself, but he gave it to a lame, crippled misfit. Oh, the grace of God. And then he said, Thou therefore... And thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said unto the king, According to all my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Took him in as one of his own sons. Again, that's what God wants to do for each and every one of us. No matter how lame, how crippled, how messed up you are, that offer still stands. The one thing that makes me cringe worse than anything is when someone ignorantly tells me, but when I get myself straight, I'll be in church. You'll never get yourself straight. If that's what you're waiting for, God is the only one that can do that. You come to him with what you have and what you are and be real. And he'll fix that. He can fix all of that. And it says, Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Mitchell. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter to God. It didn't matter to David. So my misfit friend, whoever you may be this morning, 
God wants you to experience the love and the mercy and the grace that is beyond what you can imagine. He wants you to feast from his table all the days of your life. And in the end, to dwell in his house. All you need to do today is bow to him and admit you're not worthy. Bring your baggage with you. It's okay. Your problems, your sicknesses, your weaknesses. And give yourself to him and come and eat at his table. That's why Jesus came to this earth. Because man could not save himself. Man had messed up so bad that he desperately needed a savior. Jesus himself said, the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And so this morning, if you are lost, don't you wait another moment when we give the invitation and come down here and let somebody pray for you so you can understand God's mercy and grace. Maybe you do know the Lord, but you have felt yourself so unworthy for so long. Well, leave your baggage at the altar this morning and let God let you walk out of here with a clean slate. It doesn't really matter what you've got when you bring it to him. You leave it with him today and let him heal you, cleanse you, and make a new creature out of you this Christmas season. Shall we stand? We have a song of invitation. And as always, no matter what your situation, this altar is always open for you. Whatever problem you have, whatever emotional baggage you're carrying, it doesn't make any difference. He is able. Not only is he able, he's willing as well. We have some folks that will receive you if you need prayer. But let's come around the altar and do business with the Lord this morning. Come and let's pray about it, whatever's on your heart.